Namaskar. Today we are going to speak on Savitri and initiation to Savitri. Savitri is the quintessence of Sri Aurobindo's yoga that reflects the heights of his attained consciousness that is the supramental consciousness. Hence it is beyond the reach of human mind and it can only be appreciated to some extent though only by a psychic approach. In fact the mother states that it is, it is the poetry of tomorrow and it will be appreciated only in the future. Well, that does not mean that we at present with our human faculties and some intuitive powers cannot approach Savitri. The only thing that we should remember is that we can be initiated to Sri Aurobindo's Savitri by reading, by comprehending, by grasping as much as possible the deep significance of the protagonists Ashrapati, Dimatsena, Satyavan and Savitri as given by the poet himself. It is only then that we can come to know a little deeper the significance and meaning of Savitri and get to gauge its eternal subject and its infinite appeal. Most of us I know who read Savitri on a regular basis are charmed by it, are attracted by the, by the verses, by the imagery, by the colors, by the rhythm, and even if not all, there is somewhere a deep delight. Is it the delight of the mind, delight of the emotion, delight of the psychic being? We don't know. But each one of us, if we can cross the initial barrier of the language, sometimes you know it's difficult to hold the language, but if we can cross that initial barrier, then the delight is our reward. That's why perhaps the mother tells us not to read Savitri with the mind because it is not only the mind's delight but there is a deeper delight. There is a response to Savitri's by our own deeper self. But today I would like to speak to you about what Sri Aurobindo has given the deepest secrets of the four protagonists. Because if we, if we grasp that, as I said, the road becomes clear. Then this entire play, the drama of Savitri, the story of Savitri gets a different dimension. There is no more the story of Mahabharata. It is way higher, way superior to that story. So first of all, let us see what Sri Aurobindo has said about it, has written. He says, Ashrapati is the lord of the horse, the lord of tapasya. The concentrated energy of the spiritual endeavor that helps us to rise from the mortal to the immortal planes. Well, we'll explain all that a little later as we go, go by. Second, Savitri. Savitri is the divine word, daughter of the sun, goddess of the supreme truth, who comes down and is born to save. Satyavan is the soul carrying the divine truth of being within itself, but descended into the grip of death and ignorance. 
Dimatsena is the lord of shining horses, hosts. Father of Satyavan is the divine mind here fallen behind. Well, you see, these are the four characters, personalities. But we will see, are they really characters and personalities at all? We will come in the end of our talk, we will see about that. So, let me now little explore and explain each of these concepts. Ashrapati, the Lord of Tapasya. Well, all of us know that in the Vedas, the word Ashra signifies power. Ashra also signifies horses. Hence the fundamental meaning, the fundamental meanings of this word Ashrapati are therefore pervading existence, enjoyment, strength, solidity and speed. Shall we not say therefore that Ashra to the Rishis meant the unbroken, unknown power made up of force, strength and solidity, speed and enjoyment that pervades and constitutes the material world, right Sri Aurobindo. It may also mean in the light of Sri Aurobindo, Ashra means the mind power or tapas. To make it in simpler language, that Ashrapati represents two things as a personality. One is that he is representing tapas and in our Indian philosophy we know tapas and chit go together, chit tapas we call it. So of the chit tapas, tapas is represented by Ashrapati. And then the second aspect is that he represents human aspiration towards the divine. So these are the two peculiar and particular and unique characteristics of Ashrapati. So, de so describing the first one, that is uh, the power of, of tapas, I have selected a few lines from Savitri. His was a spirit that stooped from larger spheres into our province of ephemeral sight, a colonist from immortality. Affiliated to cosmic space and time and paying here God's debt to earth and man, a greater sonship was his divine right. Although consenting to mortal ignorance, his knowledge shared the light ineffable. A strength of the original permanence, entangled in the moment and its flow, he kept the vision of the vasts behind. A power was in him from the unknowable. This is a, a few lines. But these describe really the essence of his, of his character. That he is a colonist from immortality. That means somebody who has come from the higher regions. And he, he says it very clearly. Affiliated to cosmic space and time. A greater sonship was his, was his divine right. So he doesn't belong to humanity on one side. He has his descent and avatarana. He has come down upon humanity. So his knowledge shared the light ineffable. The light ineffable light L capital. And then he is a strength of the original permanence. You see the word strength and then power. He uses all this vis-a-vis -vis Ashrapati. His knowledge, his strength, his power. A person who has come down from a higher realm. So that is one aspect. And that is one of the most important aspects. And we will see toward the end how it becomes the most important. Then the second aspect of Ashrapati. Second aspect is, as we said, he does represent the human aspiration. You know, we have seen that it is his aspiration, his desire that brings down Savitri. 
How does it happen? Well, of course, we have seen the long journey, the ascent into the different worlds from the subtle physical to the supreme, the superconscious worlds. Here is a very beautiful world stair described by Sri Aurobindo. An ascent through the world stairs, which as we know, was the ascent of Sri Aurobindo himself. That is where we see the unique aspect of Sri Aurobindo, his yoga of transformation being described through the yoga of Ashwapati. So once he goes to the Supreme, the goddess Surya Savitri, he prays to her, O radiant fountain of the world's delight, world free and unattainable above, O bliss who ever dwells deep hid within, while men seek thee outside and never find, mystery and muse with hieratic tongue, Incarnate the white passion of thy force, mission to earth, some living form of thee. See, here is a person who has seen the suffering of humanity and then who had also has a glimpse of the future humanity, future of humanity, future humanity, the next humanity. So once having seen these possibilities, he is invoking the Divine Mother, praying to her, saying that, please incarnate the white passion of that force. So he is asking, not only consciousness and light, but remark the word, white passion of thy force. It is almost, you know, a, a, a consciousness full of light and force. And that, it says, mission to earth, some living form of thee. So it is very clear and obvious that he is asking the Supreme Mother to incarnate. And here we see that in the original story of Mahabharat, Ashrapati also asked for a son. But there too we see that the Supreme Goddess Surya Savitri grants him a daughter. Why is a daughter? Well, it's a debatable question. It, lead, it will lead us further away from my, our present purpose. But he is very clear. He says, I want a form of thy passion, of thy force. Now, in response to that, the Divine Mother tells us, tells him, it's a promise. Imagine the Divine Mother herself assuring him, a seed shall be sown in death's tremendous hour, a branch of heaven transplant to human soil. Nature shall overleap her mortal step. Fate shall be changed by an unchanging will. Well, this is again the summary of Savitri's work. I mean, these are such marvelous lines that later on in book 11 and book, two, uh, book 10, we have great descriptions of this. But here is the gist of the mission that Savitri is going to have. A seed shall be sown in death's tremendous hour. You see the very, hour, very first line says, in death's tremendous hour, that is in human life on earth, there will be somebody who will come down. Who is that somebody? A branch of heaven transplant to human soil. That means from the higher hemisphere, the higher consciousness, or the supraconscient consciousness, somebody will come. A branch, it says a branch is an avatar, it's not the fullness, but the branch is an avatar, is the consciousness of the avatarana, of the avatar who comes down. And what will be the result of that descent? Nature shall overleap her mortal step. This is very, very particular. That mortality will be ended. There will be the reign of the immortal. So it, he says it very clear. Nature shall forget about all mortality. They shall reign in something of the immortal. And then a beautiful line, almost the, the crux of Savitri's work. Fate shall be changed by an unchanging will. 
Fate means doom, death, and then about the darkness, etc. All this will be changed. Fate shall be changed. So these are the four lines that we really read are the crux of the work of Savitri. So we see this is the first description of Savitri even before she is born upon earth in a human body. So here is what Sri is describing that is already coming true where Sri tells us describing Savitri he says Savitri is the divine word. With Savitri there are three or four uh, descriptions. One, she is the divine word. Second, she is the daughter of the sun. So what we said about the, the a, a, a branch of heaven shall be brought down, transplanted. She is the daughter of the sun god, the Surya. The third one, she is the goddess of the supreme truth. The supreme truth, you may call it the supramental truth, truth consciousness, whatever you want to call. So she is the goddess of the supreme truth who comes down and is born to save humanity. So you see there are quite many descriptions about Savitri. So the first one, we have had a description before birth by the supreme herself who gives us a description saying that she will change, she will be the seed. She will be the branch of heaven and fate shall be changed. And remark one thing, is all future tense. A seed shall be sown, a branch of heaven transplant, nature shall overleap and fate shall be changed. So this is a kind of a prophecy. And in this prophecy lies the mission and work of Sabitri. So that's the first description. And then we see the second one, I am bringing some of the descriptions about Savitri because in order to explain what Shri the writes here about divine words, son of, daughter of son etc. We have to go through the other sketches that Shri Aurobindo has given in Savitri. The first sketch is that given by the Supreme Mother, Supreme Divine Surya Savitri of Savitri. Second one is a beautiful description by Ashwapati, the father. Third one is by Narad. And of course the fourth one is given indirectly when Savitri herself takes up her own transcendental form. So I will take you through some of these cardinal principal ideas and lines from these four descriptions. The first one we have already seen that fate shall be a branch of heaven transplanted to human soil. That is the first one. Now the second one is the daughter of Ashwapati. Now this is given by, far by her father and uh, he is now asked Savitri who was asked to go and find in that kingdom her own life partner. So when she returns after having met with Satyavan, she goes to the, the court, the, the king's court, where they see, she sees only Dhimatsena, I mean sorry, she sees uh, king, Narad and his own mother, her own mother. So he says, who Ashwapati, he, he gives a description here, he saw through depths that re reinterpret all, limited not now by the dull body's eyes, new found through an arch of clear discovery, this intimation of the world's delight, that is about Savitri, this intimation of the world's delight, this wonder of the divine artists make, carved like a nectar cup for thirsty gods, this breathing scripture of the eternal joy, this net of sweetness woven of orient fire. A beautiful description which brings out the beauty, the delight, the joy that exudes from the body of Savitri. So as Sashwapati is the father, we are given here a physical description, the beauty of the physical Savitri, her beauty and greatness. So we see the line is, 
this intimation of the world's delight, this wonder of the divine artist made, as if the divine in his greatness as an artist has made this beautiful form of Savitri. It is a very subtle description, but then we see he asks her about her own journey, what has happened to her search. And here are one of the most beautiful, most powerful sentences. Savitri tells that she has found her soulmate. Who is he? The son of Dimatsena, Satyavan. I have met on the wild forest's lonely verge. My father, I have chosen. This is done. From the point of a lyrical beauty, as a, as a lit literature point of, from the point of a literature, these are magnificent lines. This is the extremely simple, pointed, powerful. There is no imagery, there is no description, there is no flowery description, nothing, no symbolism. Because this is a fact. So she says, my father I have chosen. This is done. Somewhere else she says, I have chosen, I will choose not again. So this is Savitri, who is, as we know, the daughter of Ashwapati. And Ashwapati himself is the lord of, the, of tapasya, of power, of energy. So being his daughter, she too has the tremendous power and will. To the extent she says that I have chosen. There is no compromise about it. There is no discussion that is going to take place. And I am not going to change my choice. So in a very simple description, Sri brings out one of the most poignant sentences in the entire Savitri. And that shows the willpower. And that itself kind of brings out, for the first time, the hidden divinity within Savitri. That now for the first time she is becoming conscious that she is somebody, she is an incarnation, that she has come with a mission. She is not just being a beautiful daughter of Ashwapati, there she knows that she has a mission. And therefore, this is a wonderful line to be remembered by all of us. And now comes the third description by Narad. And then Narad, he too is there in the hall, in the court. And then when he sees Savitri entering, he asks Savitri, On what high mission went her hastening wheels? Whence came she with this glory in her heart? And paradise made visible in her eyes. What sudden God has met? What face supreme? He can see the glow, the joy, the wonder in Savitri's body and face. So he knows perhaps being in Narada the Muni, he knows whom she has met already. But you see, he has to hide his own happiness. He cannot reveal it immediately. So he says, on why, what high mission went her hastening wheels when she came with this glory in her heart and paradise made visible in her eyes. You see the beautiful description? Paradise made visible. That means the great happiness, the joy, the transparency, the light, the luminosity. All that he sees in her eyes. And then after a long discussion where we see Savitri's mother arguing with Narada about the whole decision, etc., then Narad, uh, the discussion will take place, but first of all, Narad, after describing Satyavan, he says, he announces the prophecy. And look at the language also, so dense, so thick, so heavy. In one brief year, when this bright hour flies back and perches careless on a branch of time, this sovereign glory ends heaven lent to earth. This splendor vanishes from the mortal sky. Heaven's greatness came 
but was too brave to stay. Twelve swift-winged months are given to him and her. This day returning, Satyavan must die. It comes like a hammer. This day returning, Satyavan must die. You see, it's a prophetic language. The symbols are plenty. And yet the meaning is so clear, not couched in any symbolism which is not clear. Very clear, twelve swift-winged swift -winged months are given to him and her. That means to Savitri and Satyavan, only twelve months are given. And this day returning, Satyavan must die. So this is a question we see from two different angles. One is, on the deeper level, Satyavan Narad knows everything but he pretends not to know what Savitri has been up to in the forest because he says, whom have you met, etc. It's obvious he knows because he has given a description of Satyavan. But then the real question is that when he says that Satyavan must die, does Narad know or does not know what happens after the death Because yes, we know on the twelve on the on the after one year, twelve swift winged months, Satyavan does collapse in the laps of Savitri, and for all purposes he dies. But then the question is, does Narad know that he will die and he will recover? The second part. He does not know, apparently. Otherwise, he would have perhaps revealed in some way that Satyavan may come back. But he has, he has said this so forcefully as a definite end that this day returning Satyavan must die. There is no chance that he will not die. Well, this is a question that comes to all of us that why did Narada not know or why did he not reveal? Well, it is difficult to answer that. But luckily I came across a sentence from the mother, an explanation. She says, Narad did not know nor could he know that Satyavan will return. That is because Narad as a Muni, he is of the level of the overmental consciousness. What does it imply? That he does not know the whole truth. You see, he knows the truth that is going to be there at the horizontal level. As we have been given the explanation, that there are different levels of destiny. There's a, diff there's a level of destiny on the physical level. There's a level of destiny on the vital level. Similarly on the level of mind. And then sp similarly on the level of spiritual consciousness. The higher destiny can cancel the destiny of the lower levels. So destiny is not unilinear. It is multi-leveled. So what Nara does not know is that there is a destiny beyond control by the supramental consciousness which can nullify the destiny on the physical level and on the physical level we know that Satyavan will die. So what has been achieved, what, what has been done, fulfilled, completed on the physical level is what Nara sees and can see, it is within his capacity. And maybe on the on the vital and the mental level too he can see. But the transcending level of supermind, he does not have the vision of that. That is where the mother explains 
that narad does not know could not know did not know about the revival because the revival and return of narad uh, of satyavan is what is exactly the message of sri aurobindo and the mother that there is going to be a new level a new consciousness a new human being a new superman who will be born upon this earth perhaps in the same human body to begin with but he will bring a new consciousness and that is the new consciousness of the superman that was a secret that was not known to narad because is a secret is a knowledge that goes beyond the over mental consciousness and beyond the over mental consciousness it is sri aurobindo and the mother who have traveled there who have seen there who have conquered that uh, consciousness who have imbibed that con- imbibed that consciousness and therefore they knew the secret of course you would say what about the story of mahabharat there also we see satyavan coming back but there the implications of satyavan coming back is not a new race it is just on the level of morality and to show the strength of the chastity of a woman that if there is a purity in women's love for the for her husband then it can such things can happen it was more a religio moral lesson that was being given the possibility was there but here in sri aurobindo savitri a legend and a symbol we see a new interpretation coming in it is the question of a new consciousness of a new race being born well that is where we i have something to say about narad and then we have the, the other one that savitri is the goddess of the supreme who comes to comes down to and is born to save now the first question is save whom well we did say it is to save humanity she did not come to save satyavan alone well on the physical level yes satyavan her husband she demands his life return of his life to the physical but then she has not come here come down upon earth only for the return of one individual whom she loves her own soul mate but we know that in sri aurobindo this entire savitri is dealt on a cosmic level whereas on the level in the, the story of mahabharata is more on the individual level reflecting the morality and the religious beliefs of that time but in sri aurobindo the whole story takes up a higher dimension a vaster dimension the dimension of universality so the entire purpose of savitri is not just to save her husband satyavan but to save humanity and then what as we know that all the saviors of humanity who are called avatars have not been much understood ill understood and ill treated too so Shrobindo has a beautiful line here very sad lines befitting the human consciousness he says mortality bears ill the eternal's touch it fears the pure divine intolerance of that assault of ether and of fire it murmurs at its sorrowless happiness almost with hate repels the light it brings it trembles at its naked power of truth and the might and sweetness of its absolute voice so we human beings in our narrowness we cannot stand for long the light and the consciousness the sweetness the beauty of the divine saviors we know the famous case of of jesus christ himself how we have repaid his love for humanity by putting him on the cross so every avatar every savior is somehow or sometime put on a cross of suffering and pain so savitri too tries to save humanity but she too has to undergo the problems of death the resistance of death the suffering and pain but in spite of all that what is beautiful is 
Rishi doesn't want to escape this save this pain and suffering. So when the Supreme Divine offers her choices to leave this humanity and to come to a higher heaven where she can be in blissful peace and joy, she de- she declines all those boons. And she says only one thing, Lord, give me. Thy embrace which rends the light, which rends the living knot of pain. Thy joy, O Lord, in which all creatures breathe. Thy magic flowing waters of deep love. Thy sweetness give me for earth and men. This is the true consciousness of the avatar. His suffering and pain is, is immaterial. He does not change his idea and he does not hate humanity, although they are sending to the gallows and to the cross. Here is Savitri. She says, no, I don't want my own salvation. And she says, I want only thy embrace, which rends the living knot of pain. All this pain and suffering of humanity can be annulled only by the divine embrace of love. And thy magic flowing waters of deep love, thy sweetness give me for earth and men. So always she thinks of the earth, of humanity, how to elevate it, how to transform it. Now next coming to the first part of the same sentence, Prabhupada Sri Aurobindo writes that she is the supreme truth. Well, this is something very, very important, which brings us very close to one of the major themes that we see, the debate, the dialogue, between Savitri and death. Now when it comes to the question of the ultimate transformation of death, what do we see? You see this entire, the entire crux of this dialogue is simply this, that death is trying to hold on to the human mind, its logic and experience against Savitri. But Savitri goes beyond him manifesting a higher consciousness. You might have noticed in this entire debate that there is no equal dialogue. That means the equal level of dialogue. Death says something which represents the human mind. Its logic, its necessities, its illogic, its prejudices. But Savitri never replies to death on that human level. She always confronts him with a higher level of consciousness, with higher love, with higher, you know, compassion. So this is where we say that she conquers death not by force, but by love. And yet in the, in the poem, in the epic, when uh, Savitri sees the last resistance of death, you see, till the end death, death does not give in. So ultimately he has to challenge Savitri to say, show me your real face. Who are you who are trying to argue so much? And then in answer to his last question, Savitri says, and Savitri looked on death and answered not. Now here are the lines, the last beautiful lines, the most powerful ones. A mighty transformation came on her. A halo of the indwelling deity, the immortal's luster that had lit her face and tented its radiance in her body's house. Overflowing made the air a luminous sea. In a flaming moment of apocalypse, the incarnation thrust aside its veil. And Ms. Here we see Savitri throwing aside her human veil, the outer form, and the subtle physical level, of course. And then what does she become? A little figure in infinity, yet stood and seemed the Eternal's very house, as if the world's center was her very soul, and all white space was but its outer robe. Eternity looked into the eyes of death, and darkness saw God's living reality. The last two lines definitely speak 
of Savitri, the transcendental aspect. What is it? Eternity looked into the eyes of death. It is not Savitri anymore. Savitri, the transcendental eternity. And darkness saw God's living reality. Darkness is death. Which for once now sees who Savitri really is. As she is the divine reality. Here taking an incarnation as form of Savitri. Such a revelation of her own highest consciousness is crucial for the transformation of death. She has to rise into her own transcendental self in order to command immortal death. It is from her highest consciousness, that of the Divine Mother, that Savitri can dissolve the universal darkness and bring out its hidden truth, that of being the son of Sun Vivaswan. I am sure most of you who have read Savitri will know that death is not killed, he is only transfigured, transformed into its own true face. It is as if removing the mask which is called death and behind the mask of death, who is there? He is Vivaswan and who is Vivaswan? The son of sun. So originally we see all these beautiful Vedic explanations. There is nothing called death, there is nothing called anti-divine force, there is nothing. It is not that the anti-divine force can have a deity, can be a god. So interestingly, Sri never called death Yama. Because Yama is to make a god of the negation, of the negativity of life. So anything de- negation of the divine cannot be having the face of a god. You cannot be having, cannot be a god. So Shravanda doesn't bring in the name Yama, which our Hindu religion, Hindu thinking, Hindu philosophy has made out of this negative aspect a god, and a god more feared. So that's a part of the religious sentiment, the fear of death, fear of Yama, fear of the god Yama. Shravanda does not believe in that. He says only a mask, the divine puts on a mask called death and Savitri removes that mask and there she unveils the true divinity, the son of sun, the Vivaswan. So once having done that, we see now, we come to the last explanation of the sun word. So after going through this, all these descriptions, we understand now the meaning of sun word. So Savitri carries within herself the vibration and the consciousness of the supramental Mahashakti. Hence she represents the sun word. Sun being the symbol of the supermind is very obvious. Sun is the symbol of the supermind and the sun word is the consciousness, the, the expressive, the manifesting consciousness of supermind. So obviously this supramental consciousness has come into action upon earth. It is not a peaceful, it is not a passive consciousness, it is a dynamic consciousness. That is why she descends upon earth, that is why she is called the sun word. So Sri brings down the action of the supramental consciousness to transform world. The Vedic rishis of yore were surely familiar with the consciousness of the supermind, but were perhaps not aware of the process to manifest it on earth. Well, some of you may know. That is, the Vedic Rishis and the Upanishad Rishis did speak of the Supermind. But they did not bring it down. They could not bring it down. Maybe the time was not, was not perfect, was not the right time. Maybe the process to bring it down was not there. Maybe the yoga that was necessary was not there. So it was left to Sri and the Mother through the process of yoga to manifest it. And then secondly, perhaps that was not the time of a collective transformation. Because that's what you should remember, the supermind always works on a collectivity more than on individuals. It can be spearheaded by individuals, but the action of the supermind requires a huge stage of humanity itself. Whereas the consciousness of the overmental consciousness, it can work on individuals, little pockets, little movement, little places, little spots. 
But super mind cannot act on small portions and spots. It acts on a universal level, on the earth level, on the humanity level itself. So that level of the collective consciousness was perhaps not yet prepared during the Vedic times and hence it is not time to bring it. So it left to Sri Aurobindo and that is why now Sri Aurobindo in Sri Aurobindo's book Epic Savitri, she becomes a representative of a collective transformation. Not like Savitri of Mahabharata who becomes a, a, a beautiful wife, a very faithful wife to get back only on the individual level, her own, her own husband Satyavan. Now having seen Ashwapati and Satyavan and, Ash, and uh, Savitri, we have two more protagonists and again very interesting we have to see. One is known as Dhimatsena and the word, the, the, the name itself says, suggests that Dhimato Vipran, that is luminous sage. The Sri says now, his Dhimatsena is described as Lord of the Shining Hosts. What are the shining hosts in the, in the Vedic terminology? They are the shining hosts of the cows. And again, cows in Vedic terminology represents consciousness. So here is Dhimatsena who represents higher consciousness, the chit. In our terminology we see now, chit is represented by Dhimatsena and Ashwapati represents tapas. But we have another description which is interesting given by Sri Aurobindo that Dhimatsena is the, is the divine mind here fallen blind. Losing its celestial kingdom of vision and through that loss its kingdom of glory. Now what is this divine mind? The divine mind is again referring to some, some aspect, some level of the supermind itself. And now we see the supermind has here fallen blind, has come down upon ignorance, into ignorance, up, upon earth life, earth consciousness and it has become blind. That means it has lost its glory and its power. So here also there is a very symbolic gesture of the supramental consciousness descending into earth and its consciousness. And therefore we see that it has also lost its power. But what is interesting is the combination of Sashtrapati and Dhimatsena is required to transform earth and to open earth to divinity. How combination? We see Ashwapati brings down the incarnation of Divine Mother Savitri and then Dhimatsena, the power that is there within hidden, the supramental power that is there hidden within matter also ascends. Now this becomes perhaps more clear when we come to the last person, personality, Satyavan. And I'm doing this particularly keeping Satyavan in the end because his interpretation or trying to understand Satyavan makes the whole thing much clearer, the whole image, all the other three aspects come, to, to come together. Now who is Satyavan? Satyavan is the soul carrying the divine truth of being within itself but descended into the grip of death and ignorance. Rashura Bindu. So he is a soul carrying the divine truth, Sat, he is carrying the divine truth. But then he has descended into the grip of death and ignorance. So what does it mean? The soul descended into, the, into death and ignorance. In fact we have a description in Savitri, he is my soul that gropes out of the beast to reach humanity's heights of lucent thought and the vicinity of truth sublime. He is the Godhead growing in human lives and in the body of earth beings forms. He is the soul of man climbing to God in nature's surge out of earth's ignorance. So this is very very interesting to see that Satyavan is the soul that gropes out of the beast and he is the Godhead growing in human lives. He is a soul of man climbing of God, climbing to God. 
So, here is a soul and of course I will read out one more thing. Mother would say Satyavan is the soul of earth, the earth jiva. So, what does it imply? So, here is Satyavan who has descended into the very inconscient and from there he is evolving. You see how does it, what does it mean? That we have known from the story of creation that the mother had recounted that the first instance of the creation there is the creation of the inconscient, darkness, untruth, falsehood. So all these four powers that were anti-divine had taken possession of the earth. But in order to save this earth it is the divine himself who descends directly into the inconscient and there he lies as a consciousness that is to evolve. And very interestingly the mother says that first descent of the divine consciousness into the inconscient is called the first avatar. So now we see this entire meaning of this evolution. Who evolves? It is that first descent of the divine who is evolving centuries and millions of years. But it is that divine consciousness which is waking up from the inconscient to the level of matter. From the level of matter to the level of life. From that of life to that of matter, um, of mind. And from the level of mind into a level beyond mind. And so now here it becomes significant, significant that that is why we say Satyavan is climbing. We see, we have the line where we say that he is a soul of man climbing to God. That means evolving. So it is not just the outer nature with different form that, it, that, that there is an evolution. This outer evolution, the outer form is nothing but an expression, a need of the inner evolving soul. So this soul is not the soul like you and me, the human being soul. It is the spark of the divine. And that spark of the divine is again the essential love of the divine. So what is the aspect that is evolving? That aspect of the divine love. So we see very peculiarly here, the Satyavan is the, is the first avatar coming up to different levels and it is he who is taking the different forms of the avatarhood. But at the same time, Sri Aurobindo would express, would explain that for each of these evolving avatars, there's got to be a counter descent of an again an avatar, the form of the avatar. That is what is the meaning of the Dasha avatar that we speak of in a Hindu Indian philosophy. So here, Satyavan is now coming to that level of the mind, and he says. To reach, he is my soul that gropes out of the beast to reach humanity's heights of lucent thought. So it's the same soul which was there in the, in the, on the level of the beast, the animal level, and the same divine soul or the soul of Satyavan who has become humanity's lucent thought. That means the level of the mind. So that level of the mind is what is reached by Satyavan now. Now where do we stand? Now here we see Satyavan having reached the level of mind. From the level of the mind, now there is an evolution toward that of supermind. And so this aspiring soul is called the Satyavan. And now with, for the aspiring soul, there has got to be the descent of the supramental Shakti, supramental consciousness. And that descent of the supramental consciousness is none else but Savitri herself. So there is a conjunction of the, of the aspiring evolving soul of Satyavan and that of the Savitri, the, the descent of the Savitri power, Savitri consciousness, the supramental Shakti. So in their union is the birth of the new consciousness, is the birth of the superman. So what has happened? Dimatsena also who has fallen blind into this inconscience it is he, it is that consciousness which is keeping up the consciousness of Satyavan. So we see now the story, whole story coming together. But all the four of them are working together for the evolution. 
And yet Sri Aurobindo would say that you see in the last part of this, uh, the little note that he wrote on Savitri, he says, after explaining these four pers- um, this, uh, protagonists, Sri Aurobindo writes, still this is not a mere allegory. The characters are not personified qualities, but incarnations or emanations of living and conscious forces with whom we can enter into concrete touch and they take human bodies in order to help man and show him the way from his mortal state to a divine consciousness and immortal life. This is the conclusion. To say that these four personalities, they are not just characters or personalities, but they are incarnations and emanations of living consciousness forces. So this see, Shravinder Savitri suddenly takes a great evolutionary leap. These four persons are not just human, are not personalities or characters or qualities. They are the eternal incarnations and emanations and of living forces and they show humanity the way from his mortal state to a divine consciousness. So we see very clearly that these are the four eternal incarnations who time and again take human form in order to help humanity to grow into a divine consciousness. So what emerges as a complete picture when we look at all these incarnations and what these four personalities kind of represent? To my mind they represent a dynamic and dramatized presentation of Satchidananda in manifestation. It presents the descent of the four aspects. What the Savitri presents the descent of the four aspects. Truth, consciousness, force, ananda on the earth and also the ascent of earth consciousness to the superconscient represented by the evolutionary leaders Satyavan, Ashwapati, Dimasena and Savitri respectively. In this manner we may relate Sat with Satyavan, Supermind or Truth Consciousness with Dimatsena, Tapas with Ashwapati and Ananda with Savitri, the incarnation of love. These four personalities have descended on the earth and made it a field of the full manifestation of Satchitananda. They are plunged into ignorance with specific missions. Satyavan descended to, a, to give a thrust to evolution beyond the grip of death and ignorance. Savitri came down to save humanity. Ashwapati took birth to help humanity rise from the mortal to the immortal planes by bringing down on earth the incarnation of the Divine Mother. And lastly, Dimatsena, who has here fallen blind, regains the kingdom of glory clearing the next step in human evolution. The link between these four personalities is inseparable as Sat, Chit, Tapas and Ananda. It is one single consciousness. Therefore, these characters are not just personified and qualities but conscious forces. And Savitri, this legend and a symbol, is not only the fulfillment of the Vedic prayer Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityor ma amritam gamaya. But it goes beyond to liberate humanity from dukkham and it brings anandam, dukhe ma anandam gamaya. Avatars have struggled and suffered to save humanity from asat and tamas, but not much could be changed in the human consciousness previously. The probable reason for the unsuccessful transformation of human nature is the grip of death or human consciousness. Well, that is why Sri Aurobindo characterized death as negation. Because whatever progress was being done upon earth and humanity, there is always this negative aspect which nullified all the work, all the evolution, all the progress. So it was the biggest block in humanity's collective evolution. So we see in Savitri the transformation of death itself. Because once death is removed from the way, from on the way, from being a block, 
then the other things of falsehood uh, untruth and suffering they can be transformed that is why this big battle is not with un unconsciousness or untruth or falsehood or suffering but the first battle is with death because that is the biggest block in this evolution of consciousness is this evolution of earth so shobinda would say that this ultimate victory over unconsciousness and untruth and death will come but and that promise is given by savitri and satyavan because it is their mission and as we have seen all the four have come this time together in order to transform death and take humanity beyond into a higher consciousness called the supramental consciousness and here is a beautiful passage with which i end o oh death not for my heart's sweet poignancy this is what uh, savitri tells that o oh death not for my heart's sweet poignancy nor for my happy body's bliss alone i have claimed from thee the living satyavan but for his work and mine our sacred charge our lives are god's messengers beneath the stars to dwell under death's shadow they have come tempting god's light to earth for the ignorant race his love to fill to fill the hollow men i'm sorry his love to fill the hollow in men's hearts his bliss to heal the unhappiness of the world this is what satyavan explains and uh, savitri explains that our lives are god's messengers beneath the stars to dwell under death's shadow they have come tempting god's light to earth for the ignorant race his love to fill the hollow in men's heart his bliss to heal the unhappiness of the world so this is the mission of savitri this is the mission of satyavan this is the purpose of ashrapati and this is the role played by dimatsena so as we said savitri is in now we can understand it is nothing but the dynamic manifestation of the truth of sachidananda himself put in a poetic form put under the under the in a pressure of shrobindo's consciousness was after all shrobindo is here to manifest the total divine the all the aspects of the divine and the total divine is nothing but sat chit tapas and ananda unlike other avatars or other yogis and other rishis who have manifested perhaps one aspect but here is shobindo and the mother who have come to manifest the totality of sachidananda and that is why this epic savitri is not just an epic a wonderful seemingly autobiographical epic but it is yes it is in fact an autobiography to a large extent but that is because savitri represents this total supramental consciousness which was manifest in sure of the and the mother so to read savitri is not just a pastime is not even a religious duty it is something to read savitri is to something to participate in the consciousness of mother and sure of the so that is why i feel as the mother has said wrote somewhere that the time spent in reading savitri will give us great rewards it is as she says to read savitri is itself to do yoga but have we the time can we take it out take our take out time from our lives it is left to all of us this is what i feel could be an overview of savitri and if you want to understand that this initiation given by shri aurobindo is a must so thank you so much friends for listening to me thanks a lot